Today we will be covering our chapter five in our course outline, which is the introduction to intellectual property. Uh, the presentation that you have come from, directly from SIPO. And as you may already know, you have this presentation. It's a PowerPoint. You have it in Brightspace um, in your content folder in your class notes. Okay. So let's begin. Give me a second. Here we go. Okay, so this is a presentation. It is uh, a bit dated in some of the information is accurate, but uh, you will see that sometimes they will give you statistics that are, you know, a bit old, but the concept, the principles that are inside the presentation haven't changed a bit. Intellectual property is a very old form or field of law that we have uh, in Canada, and we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about it in the presentation. <clears throat> okay, well, this is more uh, for you, okay, if you're starting your um, world of intellectual property. They say that you have five main types of IP. There is a sixth one that I'm going to talk about at the end that is not covered in this presentation. Yeah. So this morning, we will cover the fields of patent, trademarks, copyrights, industrial designs, and integrated circuit topography. Um, uh, there is a chance you've heard um, of copyright or trademark, um, maybe patents. The ones that usually students don't know much about or don't realize that it exists is industrial designs and integrated circuits. So we'll have a chance to roughly scratch the surface okay, this morning. <clears throat> So what is a patent? Well, I should probably start before I explain to you what is a patent. I should tell you what can you register as a patent? Okay. Well, first it either has to be a new invention. Okay, so that is the first category or a new and useful improvement on an existing patent. Why? Well, you'll, you'll see um, throughout the last 150 years, um, a lot of things have been created or invented already throughout the world. So many of the patents are now improvements on an original patent. Okay, so either it has to be, when they say novel, so you have to be the first in the world to think about it, it has to be useful. One thing, a patent cannot be something that is purely decorative, okay? That falls under another form of intellectual property. But a patent must be useful. Huh? So if we look here, okay? So the example that they've chosen, I have other examples that I'm going to show you. Uh, first of all, this is the patent on a door lock. Okay. You're going to say, why? Well, they chose this one. Okay. So what are the different types of patent that you can get for the same object? Okay. It says, well, the product. Okay. So the, the door lock. Okay. The product itself. The composition, so what are the, either they say the chemical composition uh, in lubricant for the door lock, okay? So uh, for instance, uh, if there is a special lubricant that must be used with this door lock, or sometimes what I'll say is uh, whatever you have as a WD-40, okay? So <laughs> that is a lubricant. So that product, the chemical composition, of the product 
can also be patented. Uh, they say an apparatus. So the apparatus is the machine that actually creates the door lock. Okay, so the machine, if it's a die, a special die that you need to create the uh, the door lock, well, that die can also be patented and the machine, okay, that does the work, okay, that shapes the door lock. Uh, the process, so what is the process to create the product? In this case, it's the door lock. So that process can also be patented. And all the evolutions or all the improvements that are useful, okay, all the useful improvements on each of those elements can also be patented. Huh? I was telling you before that now a lot, the vast majority of all uh, patents that are requested at SIPO are improvements on existing inventions. Okay, yeah. so you know if you have an idea and if it's useful and it's a useful improvement on an existing patent, you can have that also patented. See, now they're giving you another object, maybe something that is. Uh, a bit easier to understand. So what they're using is a mousetrap. Okay. So you have the original patent, the one from 1926, and you have another mousetrap from 1976 uh, that has three improvements. The, I'll give you a second. If you look at those, you will be able to see easily okay the uh the improvements uh, i always say the first thing that shocked me here is that home hardware existed back in 1926 because if you look it's their logo <laughs> okay it's home hardware so i didn't know that but more seriously what are the three improvements okay well, see the first one, oops, sorry about that. I went a bit too fast, it's my fault. Here you go. So the improvement, see, on the second one, there's a little plastic cheese. The improvement is not the fact that it's yellow and it actually visually looks like cheese because you know that a mouse doesn't care about that. It's the fact that it smells like cheese. Okay, so why? So it attracts mouse the uh, the mouse to the trap. Okay, so you don't have on those. You don't have to use a real cheese that you're trying to put and use it, and it's very difficult because it has to be hard cheese. Trust me. Okay, so the plastic cheese, it's the smell that attracts it. So see, it's a useful improvement. The other, the other one, the spring. The spring is longer on the second one. Why? Because it's, well, you know how a mousetrap works, okay? So it's the force, okay, of the spring that creates the impact. Don't need to be graphical, but you get the idea, okay? And the third one, there's a hook. See, here's the arm, and there's a little hook. You might wonder, well, why is it an improvement and why does it make a difference? It does make a whole lot of difference when you're trying to set the trap because the hook allows you to put the little arm right here on top and that's the pressure that will hold, okay, the spring in place, okay? And if you've ever used that with the, with the little arm, it secures it a bit more. So it's easier. And when you set it up, your fingers don't get uh, stuck in the mouse trap, only the mouse. Ah. One other very famous patent that we have here in Canada is the patent for the snowmobile that was created here in Quebec. 
Okay, so you can see the design. Okay, if you look at the drawing, it is exactly what it is. It's the drawing, the different components. Okay, in this case, probably somewhere that will uh, also have patented the process for it, but you can see the gear, the sprocket, the chain, all the element that makes it what it is or the original. And you, you know from looking at the design that the snowmobiles for now are far different from this one. So other patented, uh, other patents, sorry, um, have been registered since then with improvement on this original design. See, it's been registered in 1937. Okay, so it's, we're getting close to a hundred years. Okay, so there's been many improvements on that. Aha, something that you're also familiar with, Bell, okay, because it still exists today. But did you know that you see here, there's been five different patents that have been issued, all for, if you look within like 10 years, okay, so all improvements that are done on a previous invention, which is the telephone, okay? You're pretty sure that in, in 1877, when the first patent was registered, you know that it looked far different from what you're using today. Okay. By the way, don't, don't, don't look at your phone during the presentation. It's not a good idea. So see here, Bell Canada, was originally founded in 1980, uh, 1880, sorry, okay. So it's an old company that exists. They, they still don't know how to make an invoice that is understandable, but that's something entirely different. Um, before we get into trademarks, sorry, I'm just gonna back up the presentation one slide for a second. I'm gonna go back to Mr. Graham Bell. Uh, I'm going to go online with you, okay, because I want to show you a few things, okay. The, if you're interested, SIPO has, it. SIPO stands for the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, has its website in, uh, in French, SIPO is OPIC, oh, okay, Office de la Propriété Intellectuelle du Canada. So here, when you look at this, you can see uh, it talks about various IP. If you need to look up a form of intellectual property, they have access to their databases. Um, even for one, uh, I'll take you into their database and uh, we're gonna be looking at it together. But see, it talks about trademarks, patents, copyright, industrial design, intellectual property, um, and here the integrated circuits. So it's a nice, uh, it's a nice website if you're interested. They do have for each. Uh, oops, sorry. If I just go here, so with patent. So if you want to know what is the app, how do I apply to get a patent? Okay. Well, you're gonna need a patent agent okay, because it's very complicated, very technical. Okay, and it's a very old federal act. Okay, so it means that the, the sections of the law are not the easiest one to read, and it's a whole world in, in, in itself. So usually offices that do patents will specialize even in one type of patent, uh, like they would for a patent for um, medication. Okay, so in the medical or chemical field, uh, you're going to have patent agents that are both, sometimes there are even some that are lawyers and doctors or scientists, just to be able to understand the patent, okay? If you are curious and you wanna know what is the first patent that was ever registered in Canada, okay? We have, where is it? Here, okay, it's this one right here. And you're wondering, okay, what's that? Okay, 
the first patent that was registered in Canada is a, a machine that was built to um, measure liquids. Then you're probably looking at this and say, oh, okay, how about how complicated was it? So see here, this is William Hamilton's machine for measuring liquids. Okay, so, so you see the drawing and the explanation as to how does it work. And there's another one here. You can't really, we can't really see. Uh, oops, sorry. So that is something, something else. But that was the first patent to be registered here in Canada under SIPO. Okay, the Eureka fluid meter. I, I don't know. I use a measuring cup but that's just me, <laughs> okay? So, oh, okay, <laughs> so, but it, it's just to give you um, a, an idea if you were curious as to what is the first patent that was uh, uh, in Canada. So here, let me continue. talk about something you might be more familiar with, trademarks. So trademarks, you, you hear about that. We have students that are interested and sometimes will decide to do in their internship in a, a firm that does trademarks. You have some firms that do specializes uh, in diff various forms of IP, trademark being probably the most common one. Okay. But even for that, um, you will still to be uh, do training, sorry, uh, usually it's in-house or they pay for it. Okay, So um, I used to have a student who, when she was doing her internship in a trademarks office, uh, they sent her for uh, like a one week seminar at Miguel only on one element in trademarks. And of course, they paid for it. Okay, so that's quite interesting. It's very specialized. It's very technical. It can be very complicated, but it's very, very interesting. Okay, so a trademark. Well, it's either it's a word, a design, or a combination of the two that is used to distinguish a, a product or a brand from another. Trademarks are everywhere, okay? Trademarks are federal, remember, okay? So when you look at a trademark, okay, if you look around you, like right now, do it right now, what can you see, okay? I'm sure there might be a trademark somewhere if you're having, well, you know, if I just do that and remove, remove my cover, oh, I have the Apple logo on my iPhone, okay? So here, you see some of them, uh, it's just a word. Sometimes it's a word with the font that creates the design and some of them have a design. Okay, so it's a word like, uh, for instance, uh, Petro Canada. Eh, oops, sorry. I... Petro Canada. Okay, yes, uh, we're very proud. Back in 2010, they were a, an official sponsor, a sponsor for the uh, Vancouver Olympics. Okay, but you see, Petro Canada, people know it so much, especially here. Okay, not around the world necessarily, but here, that even if I were to remove the word Petro Canada and leave just the logo on top, so the half maple leaf, you would still recognize it. Okay, why? Because it's a brand that you see that is well known and you get to associate it with uh, luxury items. Yeah, like fuel. Yeah. <laughs> It's high-end product, right? Um, 
Um, here, what are they saying? Okay, a brand's a collection of perception in the mind of a consumer. A trademark is a distinctive indicator which uniquely identifies a particular company, individual, or product slash service. Okay. So for some, even if I said like on my iPhone, if I show you the Apple, the, the logo, it doesn't need to say Apple underneath, and it doesn't because you would know. Uh, cars, okay, have the same uh, same thing. It's a, a it's a logo, and they don't need to put the name underneath necessarily. Okay, uh, some it's because it will be integrated within the logo. Okay, but. If you were to remove that part, like, I, I don't know, Ferrari, if we remove Ferrari written underneath, but you're left with only the logo and the distinctive colors, you would be able to recognize it, okay? So if you look at, uh, I, I don't know, Honda, okay, uh, doesn't need to say Honda necessarily underneath, you recognize the logo, Audi, the same thing, any brand. Okay, so for cars here, and that's why most of them don't even bother to put the name of the company, okay. because it's already associated with a product. When I was telling you at the beginning of the presentation that some of the information is a bit dated, okay, they're giving you uh, brands or the value of the brand, but back in 2008. So I know it's old, but it's just to give you an idea that a trademark, if it's a product or something that is popular at a period in time, it's worth a lot of money, okay? Uh, so see, back then, the first, the top ranking in 2008 was BlackBerry, okay? But the, the, the businesses that you see here, as examples, have a value. Canadian Tire, Tim Hortons, Bell, okay, uh, Petro Canada, etc. Okay, so you can recognize the brand, and it's associated with a product. Okay, so the RBC logo. Well, everybody knows so what it is, what it looks like, what are the colors. Okay, because sometimes you can. Uh, register the trademark, and when you're registering the logo, you can register the colors with it. But then you're stuck with those colors. So might not be the best idea. So a trademark. Okay. What is it used for? Or what is the protection of trademark? Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so yes, the world is a competitive place, even more so now with, um, with the internet being everywhere that you can shop and buy pretty much product from all around the world, okay? Everything is at your fingertips. So it is important to protect your trademark. If you don't, then you don't benefit from uh, the same level of protection. Yeah. So what does it do? Well, it provides a proof of ownership because when you register a trademark, uh, you will get a trademark certificate. And the trademark certificate is the official document that shows that you are the owner of the brand. Of course, you don't necessarily need the paper, okay? Because you can find it on OPIC and I'll, I'll show you after this slide. Okay, when we go to the OPIC, uh, if we go into the, um, the trademark, okay, um, they have the, uh, the tab for a trademark. If you go, there is a database and you can search. Okay. Um, it allows you to flag infringements okay, under the Trademarks Act. So yes, if somebody, if you've registered a brand and somebody is trying to copy your brand, you can prove that by proving ownership, ownership and use of your trademark. That is important. Uh, prevents others from adopting similar trademarks. Yes, there's always the question of, the, of uh, counterfeit products. That is something else, but you can prove uh, the, that you are the owner 
of the trademarks. But in some instances, uh, some businesses do not care so much about the counterfeit products because it's a form of cheap publicity when you think about it. Okay, despite the fact that um, under other laws that uh, you can find uh, you can be fined for uh, usage of counterfeit products, especially if you're trying to import products in Canada. Yes, <laughs> there's still plenty on the market. But for some of those companies, instead of fighting every single little businesses that are using counterfeits, well, they say, well, it's a form of publicity for us, okay? Because we all know that uh, the original product and a copy, okay? So the counterfeit version uh, of a, <clears throat> you know, a Rolex, well, after the, if you're a Rolex that you've paid 15 bucks uh, and you're wondering after two weeks why it doesn't work anymore, think about it um, but they they can't be bothered with all those people trying to counterfeit uh it makes also licensing of the product and the services easier uh if you're trying to have a, a if you have a trademark like mcdonald's okay we'll, we'll trade we'll take one uh and mcdonald's and you're trying to they, they, they've done it, uh, but you're going to have franchises, okay? So you can sell the concept, and with the concept, you have the brand that comes with it, so the trademark that you can use, and there's a license to use that trademark, okay? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, hold on. I'm still working. So... <laughs> Uh, so yes, for licensing, we said that it makes it easier. So even when we talk about brands, um, what I'd like you to do, try to go in your house, your apartment, your room, wherever you are, and try to find at least a product that has a trademark sign on it. See, for me, here you go. Okay, I've done my work. Okay, so Royale, the facial tissue. Uh, you're saying, well, okay, so what is a brand? Did you know that even the no brand name is actually a brand? Okay, so the in if we go back online, so the no name brand is a brand. So I went to the to a pick, okay, the disciple, and I've looked up no name. Okay. So yes, it is registration. Okay, so it, it's probably here. So the registration of registration is good for uh, 10 years. So this, the no name, you know, it's the private label of Lobla. So see the registrant here is Lobla. But it, it, it's funny. So you have a no name, which is actually a name. Good concept, but same thing for president's choice. Yeah. So <laughs> here uh, they were able to label. So you see the whole process of filing approved, blah, blah, blah. So now they have their mark, no brand, uh, no name, which is their brand. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. I'm just trying to. Uh, yes, this is the, for the other one. Okay. So, uh, what else can I tell you about trademark? Uh, well, trademark is, it's a whole law. That's why we just do the overview. Uh, we don't go into the trademarks act. Um, but there is a lot of things. What can or can't you, uh, normally trademark? For instance, you're not supposed to trademark the name of a person unless 
You can prove that it's related to a product or a service and not an actual individual. I, for instance, the brand Jean Coutu. Jean Coutu, why well, it's the name of the founder. But over the years, when they tried to register Jean Coutu as a trademark, it was refused based on the fact that you can't register a person. So they had to prove to the SIPO that Jean Coutu wasn't associated with, you know, with the guy that I'm not sure, we don't see him anymore, but the, 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 the founder, Jean Coutu, with the lab coat. So we didn't associate it with that, but we did associate it with a brand of a pharmacy. So for instance, if I tell you yesterday, I stopped by Jean Coutu. Nobody here is going to think, well, gee, I wonder, did he offer you coffee? I didn't go to his house. I went to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription. Okay. So you have to be able to associate it with a product or a service. So they were able to prove that in the mind of people here, Jean Coutu is not so much of an individual as, you know, a, a, a service, which is a pharmacy. Um, also, you're not allowed to register a brand that is purely descriptive, okay? So a brand, uh, for instance, if I have here a pen, well, I can't register pen for an actual pen because it describes what it does. Uh, the same thing as a, uh, an ice cream. If I'm trying to register a new brand of ice cream, I won't be able to register the brand as cold. Why? Because it purely describes what ice cream is. I think ice cream is cold, even fried ice cream. Okay, so that's why. So it cannot describe the product. So these are like two out of the... 4,271 new rules that you have in trademarks. Do you need a trademark agent to register? No, but I highly recommend it. Okay. Because if you don't know what you're doing, uh, you may be, even if it's for you, okay, you, you want to register a brand. Well, for the trademark, uh, if you don't know, it's going to be a lot of back and forth. And you know, with anything in the government, it takes a while. So you may end up losing like a year or two years just over the fact that the, the brand, okay, well, there's something you didn't describe the product carefully. You didn't do that. You didn't include then, or you should have included this or that. So to get the best protection, go see a trademark agent, okay? On their, if you need one, on their website, on SIPO, you will see that the, uh, the trademark, there's a list and you can get a trademark agent okay? or a list of um, offices that will offer the service. Copyrights. Aha. Here for copyrights, I'm going to talk to all those, all of you that are, artist, okay? Um, copyright is very broad, okay? And it is particular in comparison to others, like such as uh, your, the trademark and a patent, okay? Because for the other, the first two that we talked about, you need to register to be protected. Okay, so if you have a patent, you need to register a patent. If you have a trademark, you need to register the trademark. Copyright is different because it exists from the moment that your work is created, such as the presentation that I'm recording for you this morning. Uh, well, that presentation is my own creation, not the screen that I'm using because I'm using SIPO's presentation, but the, the, the image, the sound, the words, the, the going back and forth, okay, that's mine. Okay, so that is protected. The notes that I give you in class, 
the notes that I do are my own, that I created, uh, all of that, it is protected through copyright. So be careful, okay? Because I'm going to sue you. So for those of you, if you are artists or uh, if you're a musician or a singer or if you write your songs or if you write a book or just a short story, it's your own, okay? So yes, you're protected, but it would be better if you have something, you've written a song, uh, uh, lyrics, the music, uh, all of it, you should officially register it through uh, SIPO, okay? They're giving you examples, okay, of things that you can do uh even if you are protected and you don't officially um copyright your work and you are still protected but ideas okay that will help you prove your rights you can have your work signed uh and dated by a witness okay so if you write uh, a, a malady of some kind. And if six years later they find something similar, well, you can have a witness saying, well, this end dated, I can come and testify that it was at that time and date that this, um, this lyrics or the, this music was created, okay? And you have a witness to testify of that. Um, you can register, obviously, the, the best one would be to register your copyright. Uh, you can use the copyright sign, okay? That's the, you see here, the little C, okay? That's the copyright sign, so you can use that. Uh, and also, this is for if you're in a band or even just like a duo of some kind, uh, like for instance, uh, you're the two friends and you decide that uh, you're going to write the music, the, the other person will write their lyrics and stuff, detail that, okay? Why? Because what if there is a feud later on, okay? What happens if the other, your, you know, your best friend for life, if they decide to go and uh, they, they, they steal your work, okay? So okay. better safe than sorry. So what you should do is that you detail whatever, what is the part that everybody is playing, okay? It helps you. So what are some examples of copyright protected um, work that we have in Canada? Well, they chose three Examples. The first one is a movie, Atanar Jouad. Okay. So this is um, a movie. And funny thing is, and I didn't make this up, and it's not even my presentation. But when I started, okay, when I was doing my articling, okay, before I became a just before I became a lawyer, and once I was a lawyer too, um, I was the one who prepared all the assignments of rights to that movie. Okay, so I it was funny when I looked at the presentation and noticed that, Ooh, okay, I, I know about that. <laughs> okay, so I even, I, I, I went to the premiere of that, you might have never heard of it, but uh, all the, this movie, we did assignments of rights in, uh, in Europe and in South America. So all, all of that, but for a movie, Okay. In a movie, what is included? Okay. Is it just a final product? Well, no. See, here they're giving you the scripts, the movie scenes, the actors, and the interpretation, the cover, the movie, the editing, the pictures. All of that are examples that can or that are protected under copyright. Uh, the Canadian Geographic. It's a Canadian magazine. It's a little bit like National Geographic, but for Canada. So here you see 
the pictures, the articles that are written, so the text, the cover, what is the layout of the cover, what does it look like, okay, how is it put together, all of that is protected. The third one is a CD. You do remember what a CD looks like, right? It's the pre-MP4. Okay. So um, for CD, so Grégory So for an artist, okay, recording artist, well, if a CD or even uh, for online also, but pictures, Okay, um, the lyrics, so inside in a CD, you have like a little leaflet and inside you had sometimes um, images or like pictures of it and the lyrics were written down. Um, the music on the CD is protected. The cover, okay, the cover image is also protected. Okay, so you see, it's not just the part that is written. It's also the visual aspect of it. Okay. So that's for copyright. Another one, another form of intellectual property that you probably never thought of okay, is called the industrial design. What's the industrial design? Well, it's pretty much the title says it all. It's the design. So it's the visual aspect. Okay. So the shape, the configuration, the pattern, or the ornament, or any combination of those. So the, the industrial design, the purpose of the design is that it looks nice or it should be appealing to the eyes. Yes, it's highly suggestive, okay? I may find a pattern super ugly and you may love it, okay? Uh, shoes, glasses, uh, all of that. There is an industrial design element about it uh, for a car. Okay, so see the car, the, the shape of the car is the design. It has no function, okay? It doesn't have a specific functionality. It's purely aesthetic, okay? So the design must be original. So it must be something new. And it has to be either two or three-dimensional. So the look of it, the shape of it, as I said, doesn't serve a purpose. Okay. So you see, we'll, we'll take the examples that uh, we have in front of us. So the lamp, what is the functionality of a lamp? It's to shed light. Okay, yes. The fact that this lamp right here looks like somebody took like, it's either like three tennis balls or three grapefruits, stack it one on top of the other and said, okay, this is gonna be the design for a lamp. The fact that it's round, you know, like the, 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 the spheres that are yellow, it serves no purpose for a lamp, okay? that's industrial design. If it were the way that it shed the light, the way that the light bulb works, uh, a way to improve for a better lamp, oh, that could be patented, okay? So the, the glasses, the shape of the glasses. Well, I think by now you, you know me. I have a few pairs of those. The shape of my glasses are very distinctive. They serve no purpose. Well, yes, okay, they, they do because I, but it's not the shape of the glasses. The purpose of glasses is to help me see. When I put them on, I don't even see my frame. So the frame is the design. Here we go. Sorry about that. There was, there's a ladybug. Sorry. 
<laughs> so before it started to crawl. <laughs> okay. So um, the, the design, it, it, nobody, nobody cares. It's a visual aspect. It's because, okay, it, it's the design of it. The purpose of it is the lens. Okay, so the lens serve a purpose. The frame, the only purpose that the frame has is to hold the lens. Okay, uh, the same way as for the lamp, the purpose of the lamp that you can see, well, it's the shed lights. So the, 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 the way it looks is only to hold the bulb. Okay, so that's what industrial design is is the the shape the appearing side to try to make it more um interesting for some people okay that's why you have designers that's their purpose i don't want to be mean okay but for some of them it seems that to 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 find useless items and you know put them together in the least uh functional way but the design looks nice, okay? So that's what industrial design is. If we go online, I'll show you the, let me get that here. Oh, my session has expired, so I'm sorry. <laughs> here we go. Ah, here we're having problems. Ah. Let me just rotate this for a second. <laughs> okay, so good. So it's not my computer's problem. It's their problem, I guess. Okay, <clears throat> I know it's upside down, but apparently when I try to rotate it, uh, yeah, okay. So they have a problem. Sorry about that. So you see, this is an upside down shape of a uh, bottle of uh, perfume. Okay. The, the, the shape, okay, we, we understand it's a container to hold perfume inside. But the shape, the look of it is an industrial design because the look, whether it is round, square, cylindrical, um, in shape of a star, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, this is the visual aspect. That's an industrial design. The, the purpose of it is to hold a liquid that is supposed to smell nice. No? I don't know if, oh yes, okay. So you see the design that we have is the shape. See, it says the design of the feature of shape, configuration, pattern, or ornament of the container of perfume as shown in the drawings, okay? So here, so what does it include? It's a container for perfume, okay? Caps, lid with dispensing means. So, and this is one of the industrial design for the uh, bottle of perfume for Valentino. Okay. So, what can you say about it? So this is the, that's the shape, okay, of it. Let me see. So what they do is that they present the industrial design. Let me see if I can get, okay, so it's, I don't know why it's when they've uploaded their images, it's, and I, I, I can't make it straight, so sorry about that. But this is what the bottle looks like. Okay, so they, they do drawings of the industrial design. This is the back, this is the front, this is the top, this is the, you, you, you get the idea, that's the other side, I guess. They have to do all sides. Yeah, okay, so are we seeing anything new? Ah, that's from the top, okay? So the pattern uh, that they're using, okay, on, for the glass. That's the industrial design. It doesn't serve a purpose. It's just there to look nice. The industrial design has no, and that's from the bottom. It has no functionality. Okay. Um, another example 
of an industrial design. The, co the evolution of the Coke bottle. Okay. So you see the first Coke bottle is very different from the one that, uh, and there's, I do believe there have been others, but anyway, it's just a, an array of uh, Coke bottles. So you see the shape has evolved over the years. Okay. Uh, but I do believe there's one that was previous to that one, which is round. Um, but you, you get the C. Uh, the idea behind the Coke bottle was that uh, the Coke bottle had to be recognizable from uh, even in the dark. So what they wanted is that anybody who would grab a Coke bottle would be able to know that it's a Coke bottle just from the feel of it. Okay. And that's what gave the, uh, at one point, see, the, once the uh, bottle evolved, it gave it the womanly shape. If you look at it, it looks like a woman's body. So the whole, so everybody that was in the dark, in the middle of the night, once you grabbed, even if it was broken, the concept was, even if the Coke bottle was broken, that you would be able to recognize just by the feel of it. But you get the point that the shape of the bottle didn't serve any purpose besides that. But the purpose of a container is to hold the liquid. Okay, it, it was to hold Coke. So the evolution of it is the different industrial designs that they've created over the years. Okay. So you can see here they're using well three types of industrial of uh, intellectual property. The first one is the trademark, Coca-Cola. The second one is the industrial design. Okay, so the industrial design is the shape of the bottle. Okay, the, uh, not, not so much the plastic bottle, but the, uh, the shape of the glass bottle. And they're using a third form of intellectual property that I will talk about in a few minutes. Once I'm done with the, uh, we'll talk about the uh, integrated uh, circuits. And then I'll explain to you what is the third form of intellectual property that Coke is using. Okay. So before we talk about that third form, let's talk about the, oops, sorry. Let's talk about the integrated circuit. So integrated circuit topographies. Okay. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in any of the forms of intellectual property. I know them. There's some like copyright that I know a bit more and trademark because of the nature of my work. And I'm but this integrated circuit is something that there's only a few people that work in that field. And even people that work in the field of IP don't know much about integrated circuit. Okay. So this is the, the 3D, the, the microchips. Okay. So the 3D configuration of electronic circuits. Okay. So you can see the way that the circuits are laid out is a form, believe it or not, of intellectual property. So the integrated circuits are found in a lot of different technologies because everything has a microchip. My cat has a mi is microchipped, well, for real. So <laughs> I don't know, is it a form of IP? I'm not sure it is, okay? Um, but, uh, computers, inside our computers and the extension of the computers would be our phones, okay? Within our cell phones, um, they're chips, okay? So computers, automobiles, you know, the expensive stuff that breaks on a car is sometimes the technology. The more technology you have, 
the most susceptible you are to one of them failing. Uh, a pacemaker. So if you, you know somebody that has a pacemaker, inside the pacemaker, there's a integrated circuit, which is actually a good thing because that's what's reminding your heart to beat. Okay, and not skip one. Uh, industrial robots, so, well, they're getting everywhere. So now from the uh, electronic vacuums, uh, the robot vacuums that we use from, um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm going around in my, in my office to see, but the microphone that I use has chips inside. Uh, cameras, so the webcam that I'm using and the cameras that, Oops, sorry, my second, I have a lot of stuff here. So the a regular camera, see the ones that a lot of people don't use anymore, but I use it from, for some of my recordings. Okay, the one that I'm using now, the, all of those cameras have chip, spacecrafts. Okay. Yes. And of course, in Canada, we're very proud of the Canada Arm. C. Canada's most famous robotic and technological achievement was made in space. Oh, the space debut in 1981. So you weren't born. But it was a big moment in time because we sent technology to space. But they have their own form of um, integrated circuits. So of course, over the years, uh, space stations, it's full of integrated circuits. So here they wanted to show you uh, integrated circuits and the combination of intellectual pro different forms of intellectual property within the same product, okay? A little bit like I did with the Coke bottle. So see the patent for the, <laughs> um, here for the BlackBerry, okay? So the patent, so the, a display of a, for a handheld computing device, that was the idea, okay? Uh, so that is a patent. The trademark is the BlackBerry trademark, the word with the font and with the logo. Okay, so that is a trademark. The last one is the industrial design, the look of it. The look serves no purpose, okay? It was put like that just to look nice, okay? So see, three different forms of intellectual property for one single product. Um, before we go and look at how long are you protected for the, um, how long are you protected for each form of intellectual property? I'm gonna talk about the sixth form of intellectual property that nobody talks about. It's called a trade secret. A trade secret, it's exactly what it is, a secret. So Coca-Cola chose something that was pretty smart, um, they decided that instead they could have patented the recipe for the Coca-Cola. But instead of doing it, and one of the reasons is because a patent expires at one point and you cannot renew a patent. Okay, we'll see it on the next slide. So because they couldn't um, renew, they decided to use trade secrets. Trade secrets is exactly what it is, to keep something a secret. Nobody knows what's in actually Coca-Cola, okay? There's been many speculations over the last century. Uh, even one of the first bottle design was designed after uh, the coca bean because the, the designers said, well, they thought that it was made with, uh, from coca beans, which apparently I don't think it is, but, okay, um, nobody knows what's in the recipe. Only the people that work in the factory with uh, limited options and non-disclosure agreements that are as long as an arm. 
Okay. The good thing is about a trade secret is for as long as the secret is kept, the protection is there. Okay. So unlike other forms of intellectual property, uh, they don't have to divulge any information. So we don't know. Okay. I, I, we just know that it can remove rust from, um, I don't know, a rusty nail. Okay. So if you put the nail, you know, the, the rust is supposed to lift. Imagine what it does to your stomach. But then again, that's another issue. Okay. So a trade secret, that's what it is. It is a secret that is kept and that will remain a secret as long as nobody divulges it. So Coca-Cola has been able to do it for more than 100 years. Okay, not bad. Because if we compare it to the other forms of intellectual property, and what are the terms and the protection? You see, the first one that we saw is a patent. A patent is good for 20 years. Okay. And a patent, you won't be able to renew your patent. Okay. So the problem with that is that if you think about medication, okay, all those big pharmaceutical companies, why do they charge so much? Because their product is patented, but they know that they only have 20 years before other businesses can start to legally copy. So for instance, the COVID vaccine. Yeah. So uh, Moderna and all the Pfizer and everybody <clears throat> put R&D and invested millions of dollars to create the vaccine. And they know that in 20 years, everybody can copy it. That's why Bayer okay, is the original manufacturer of aspirin. Okay, aspirin is salicylic acid. So now that's why on the shelves, if you go to any pharmacy, you're going to find aspirin and you're going to look and you're going to see it says Bayer on it. And, and then you're going to find salicylic acid in every private label possibly that you can imagine. So if you go to Jean Coutu, you'll have salicylic acid for la per, uh, personnel and then um, the others, which I'm trying to remember what are the uh, uh, private label for all the other like optimum or whatever it's for, um, I don't know what, but anyway, each pharmacy has its own private label, but they're able to do that because the patent has expired and it protects you nationally. Trademark. Trademark C is good for 15 years, but it is renewable. Okay, so you can renew a trademark as long as you use it. Okay, so that's one thing you can use. But for a recipe like Coca Cola, after 20 years, they would, yes, of course, there are copies, but they're never identical. Okay, you can't find a copycat of Coca-Cola. You can find colas that are kind of similar because over the years, there's a bunch of testers that are, are testers and tasters that have tried to copy. But what is the original copy and just make another one like they, they did for aspirin or Tylenol, same thing, okay? Um, or any medication that doesn't have a patent anymore. Well, for Coca-Cola, they can't, they can guess, but nobody has the actual recipe, okay? So a trademark is renewable for 15, every 15 years, okay? And it can be an automatic renewal. Copyrights. So if you're wondering music, how come sometimes we can use music and sometimes we can't, <coughs> Why does sometimes YouTube, okay, will ban a video and sometimes they don't? How does that work? Well, it's because of copyrights, okay? Copyright is normally, it's the year of uh, the life of the author 
plus 50 years. After that, it becomes public domain. Okay, so in the in the world, so that's why artists that have been dead for more than 15, 50 years, sorry, uh, that's why now, okay, uh, there's no songs, for, there's no music uh, from uh, Beethoven or Mozart, they, they, they've been dead for so many years that it falls under what we call public domain. Okay, so everybody can use it and there's no copyright. An industrial design is up to 10 years. Okay, so if you have uh, a, a design of some kind, well, you have 10 years, you won't be able to renew. So either you're, that's why they, the designers after about 10 years, they'll renew. Okay, even more than that, but in, in the fashion industry, it's more than, it's, it's as up to 10 years, but it's every two, three years that they will renew. Why? Because they know that their industrial design patent is uh, protected only for a maximum of 10 years. Integrated circuit is 10 years. That's why within uh, 10 years, um, it applies to all the, the computers and all the microchips. Well, they don't last that long, okay? Your cell phone after, um, what, a few years, you'll have, you're gonna start to have problems with it, okay? Um, there will be a new technology and that's designed to make you buy new things. Um, the uh, integrated circuits, for instance, in, the, um, in a car, Okay, in a car, about every, and notice that about 10, every 10 years, they will change a few things, such as the car, the model of a car. Why? Because that's the industrial design. Uh, and also in the, within the interior, all the electronics that will also change. Why? Because they have only a protection of 10 years. Okay. But the technology evolves for integrated circuit. Uh, the, the technology evolves so much and so fast that it rarely lasts 10 years. Okay, take a computer with the, 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 the circuits that you had 10 years ago. It, it's probably very different from what you have, not just by the look of it, but inside how it works, the 3D chips okay, will also be renewed. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. So here we all, all know um, what are the benefits of IP searches? So identify trends. Yes, uh, generate new ideas. That's the it's always the idea to innovate, uh, gain competitive intelligence, license new products, solve uh, technological uh, technical problems, and identify manufacturing partners. Okay. So yes, when you look through the databases, you know what's coming. Uh, what are the patents that are about to expire? Uh, people, some people are only waiting for that. Uh, what are the designs um, you know, that will fall under public domain? Um, all of that okay, is part of the, the benefits. Okay, so always search. You'd rather be safe than sorry. So if you're thinking about using a form of intellectual property, always make sure that uh, the benefits, okay, so you don't want to get sued for using a trademark, uh, even if you didn't know about it. So it's always good to do, okay, a little research. Okay, um, so that is or that was the uh, presentation on introduction to intellectual property. There is a little quiz that you can take if you want to. If you go in your PDF presentation, um, go to the second to last slide. And if you see, you're going to be able to take a little quiz so you can test yourself and see what you understood about the presentation and what um, maybe you're going to have more questions. Um, 
here's the website to FIPO. Okay, so if you want to uh, go look, if you're curious to try to find something, um, you can very well use that. Okay, and I invite you, if you have any questions, uh, you can direct them to me. Of course, it's a very, as I was telling you, it's a very short introduction. Okay, but I hope you learned at least a thing or two. And don't forget that this presentation is subject to your final exam. Okay, so looking forward to seeing you in class. So take care and... Well, I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.